All right, welcome back to the Recruit Pursuit podcast. I'm co-host Devin Record. Other co-host here, Evan Wiederspoon. Thanks for having us. Today we are joined by Andrew. Andrew, I can't Granaka. say your last name. Granaka. It's Granaka. all right. Okay, um, North City AAU basketball. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on and um, talking with us. You're the first coach we've had on, so we're excited to um, talk in just like a different perspective than the players, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I just, before we jump in, I do want to say thank you to both you guys and, and everything you guys have done to help promote some of these kids and the programs, you know, I, you know, I think there's always so many, there's so many quality basketball players out there and, and making sure that everybody has a chance to see who they are and what they can offer. So just, you know, from, from the basketball community, just a big thank you to, to both of you guys and, and what you guys have been doing uh, of late. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoy coming on and talking with all the athletes and connecting with them and hearing about their how they want to improve and how they do so, you know. So I really enjoy it. I'm glad I we at least helped them out a little bit. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to ask is how did how did you get North City started from the very beginning? Yeah, so um short story long. Um <laughs> I'll um, I'll try to dive into it. So mm-hmm. um I originally I had been coaching for basically I started coaching when I was in high school, um, coaching my brother's uh, AAU teams when he was in middle school, actually. Um, and continued coaching after I came back from school, started coaching in the Shorecrest, uh, at Shorecrest high school. And then in the Shorecrest select feeder program. Um, I was fortunate enough at that point when I was coaching a fifth grade team to meet, um, a gentleman by the name of Sergeant Mike Lawson, who's pretty, pretty well known in the basketball community, he did a lot of training. Um, and he also incorporated like military style training into his, his into his basketball workouts. Um, that was his background. Him and I started doing some stuff on the side and kind of saw like there was a bunch of opportunity to do training, um, kind of what we call like core strength training, really. Um, and that's kind of where it started is doing some of that training on the side. And then we had a team that was pretty good when we got to like middle school and we pulled some West Coast kids together, um, pulled together some Arlington kids and a kid from Edmonds Woodway and like, just kind of like, "Eh, let's just throw a team together. Um, It went really well. We we really felt like if you could grab eight, nine, 10 of the best kids in West Coast or even up, up I-5 corridor all the way up to Bellingham, you can compete with pretty much any AAU team out there. Um, So took off from there had one team thought, okay, that's kind of going to be it. And then the following spring, we had a bunch of interest in doing more teams. Um, and so we went from, that was in 2010. So we started the program in 2010 uh, with one team and then kind of progressively went to two teams to four teams to eight teams um, pretty quickly started adding some younger grades uh, and really just kind of continued to focus on development of a lot. A lot of it was like West Coast conference players um, but also some of the Northwest Conference, some of the in Kinko Conference as well. Um, a lot of where kids play AAU is proximity to their home. Um, so, you know, where we're usually located in, in around like the Mill Creek or South Everett area, kind of, you know, put a circle around that and kind of where we focused it. So, yeah, that's kind of where we started and, and have kind of continued to just focus on providing quality training, competitive AAU teams. Um, I guess, so it started in 2010. Um I guess I, the question I had for you was, I guess, uh, did it take a while to kind of get into your coaching style of what it had to, what you had to do to kind of coach that level and, and I guess, grow it up yeah. did you have to kind yeah. of find your way? Yeah, I definitely think there's, there's things that you can lean into, you know, let's say as far as like high school basketball coaching goes that you can lean into AU in terms of like developing positive, strong relationships with your players you know, the types of sets you want to run, the strategy, you know, the, the, the expectation that you set for each of your players in terms of like their effort and attitude. I think there's stuff that lends itself into that. Um, there is definitely a different AAU coaching style uh, just based on the way the games are played. Also, I think something that I don't think AAU coaches honestly get enough respect for is a lot of times when these spring seasons start, they have teams that are coming together for the first time or you're adding new players Mm-hmm. And you don't really have that chemistry together yet of understanding roles and what people, what, again, what the coach's expectations are. Um, and usually you only have four or five, six practices before you're going to start a tournament. And so yeah. you got to figure out what kind of structure can you put together in that time period? It's not like high school basketball where you get a minimum of 10 practices before anything is going to happen. Could be even 15 practices before there's even any kind of game. 
So I think there's, you have to kind of adjust how much do you in, put into the game strategy? How many sets are you going to try to run? What are you going to try to convince your kids to be able to do in those four or five, six practices? So I definitely think there was adjustments um, to that. And, you know, but le- looking back on growing the program and, and kind of coach's style, I think we've always leaned on as we've built our staff up. And, and this last year we had, I think like 12 or 13 on our coaching staff. It really is about making sure those coaches are building those positive relationships with the families and with the kids. And obviously they have to have the basketball knowledge. Uh, and for us, because training is such a big part of our program, it is a balance between someone who can do that individual training and, and also coach, you know, in a basketball game and it sounds simple, but there, there's not a lot of overlap in a lot of scenarios where people have both like the coaching experience and the training experience. It's kind of a left brain, right brain sort of scenario. So that's something we've tried to focus on when we have grown our staff and grown the program. So you mentioned you have uh, 12 coaches on staff. Uh, Yeah. So this last year we had 10 teams um, and then we had, I think like three or four of our teams had assistants. Uh, So we were probably somewhere between 12 and 15. Um, that are on the staff. And um, what ages do those teams range from? Yeah. So we, um, you know, kind of coming out of before. So previous to COVID uh, we, our biggest year, we had 17 teens in 2018 um, wow. from fourth, fourth grade up through high school and I'll, every grade, but one, I believe we had an, like a kind of a A and a B team or kind of gold and silver, however you want to categorize that um, coming out of COVID we've kind of, restructured to only focus on one team at each grade level. It's just, it's, it's proven to be easier with tournament selection and, and finding the right coaches and some of those things. So this last year we had 10 teams from fourth grade up through high school. Um, we had two teams at the 16 new level. And then every other grade level, we had one, one team for each of those uh, uh, age levels. Uh, what, what is, what is it like um, the tournament choosing process? Like, you know, like yeah. do you, how many teams do you bring for each tournament, you know, and like, how does all of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I think this is some of you know, when I, I've gotten to know AAU, other directors of programs over the years, and there's kind of this mutual respect of managing all that process of figuring out where 10 teams are going to go. Um, you know, it, it starts with like a pretty uh, drawn out spreadsheet on my computer, as far as like all the tournaments that are offered in the state. And then I kind of categorize those as far as like, where are we competitive wise? So each team, you know, for instance, I may have, you know, this is just hypothetical. I may have a really strong fifth grade team, but maybe my seventh grade team is not as strong. So they might have a different tournament schedule really to map to what the sort of competitive nature is. You know, they don't want to enter a tournament where they're going to lose every game by 20, but you also don't really want to enter a bunch of tournaments where you're going to win by 20 every game either. There's, there's not really a good, um, value there. So um, it is a balance. Uh, luckily, some of these tournaments offer like gold and silver brackets. So we can kind of assign those and kind of build out those those schedules. Um, and then as far as traveling and those sort of things, that comes down to the, how competitive the team is. And it also comes down to resources from the family's perspective and um, what their you know goals and objectives are. Some families are fine just playing locally. Other families want to travel. Um, so it's kind of a, a balancing act of all those those factors. Uh, going back to kind of what you uh, said earlier, um, you, you had a lot, a lot more teams, uh, you know, but pre COVID, what yeah. was it like building it back up and, you know, what kind of hurdles did you have to jump through during that time? Yeah. You got to get yeah. back to where you guys were this summer. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, Evan, I'd prefer to just forget about that time <laughs> period. I think we've all, we would all prefer to forget about that time period. Yeah. Um, yeah it, you know, it took time um, to build back up. A lot of it was, um, you know, the restrictions within the cities, county states in terms of what could actually happen. Um, And no, no, you know, sort of opinion either way on that. It was just the, the, the truth of the matter and how we were dealing with it. Um, And then the other challenge that we, that we have, which we continue to to struggle with is um, just finding gym space. And we had certain gyms that, They didn't, they decided that they weren't going to rent out to external groups anymore, or the school district decided to limit the amount of nights that they were offering. Um, So that was the biggest, that was, that is still one of the biggest hurdles as a result of COVID. And that was one of the challenges. Um, The other challenge was uh, for a while with our 20, um, so our 2020 class, um, 
uh, you may recall had um, uh, uh, DeBoer out of Linen Christian and Sam Wilson out of Monroe and, and we had some, some pretty Brennan Beyer out of Kamiak and, and some, some strong players there. Um, they all wanted to play, but Washington wasn't even allowing to host tournaments. So like we drove to Idaho a couple of times to find tournaments. Um, we, uh, we set up some scrimmages. We, you know, did kind of whatever we could do to get these kids to continue to play. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 those are kind of some of the challenges in building it back up, you know, fingers crossed we're on the other side of that and we're, we're, Mm -hmm. you know, this this year was really the first what I'd call normal as much as normal as you can, can define it as it has been since 2019. So uh, yeah, and then I think just to build, you know, just to take it a little bit of a different direction regarding COVID. You know, one thing I feel like hasn't been talked enough about is the opportunities that were missed for some of these classes. Yeah. Uh, you know, the twenty the 2020 class. So COVID shut down the week after the state tournament. So they actually were in a pretty good spot. Like they had given their, a, they had gotten their AAU opportunities and chances. Mm-hmm. The 2021 class had no uh, going into their summer AAU season, which is arguably the most important summer for most of these kids. Yeah. So they really missed out on it. And then the 2022 class, uh, they missed out on their 16U season. And then the 17U season for them, um, was really kind of watered down. There wasn't a lot of tournaments going on. Um, there wasn't as much of a recruiting opening weekend and some of those things. So um, that's been good to see that some of this stuff is getting back to normal and those opportunities are are opening back up for some of these kids. Definitely, I agree that the one class was kind of on the short end of the stick there. But, you know, yeah. luckily if you were like, I guess transitioning a little bit into the more of the recruiting talk, um, what are some things that you specifically do for your older kids Yeah. Um, in order to help guide them in the right direction on, you know, contacting coaches, finding the right school, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, um, kind of going back to what I talked about in terms of coaching philosophies. A lot of it is building relationships, mm-hmm. you know, over the years, I've built a lot of relationships with college coaches that are out there and at all levels, junior college NAIA D3, D2, D1. Um, and, and I always tell my players, you never know where coaches are moving to. And that's why you always want to be, you know, being open, transparent, having those open lines of communication. Um, uh, as far as working with the parents, it really depends on each family's scenario. A lot of some parents are more involved and they, they, they've started to work on some of the outreach to the college coaches and some of those things. And then other parents are kind of starting at starting at um that first step and really wanting some of that guidance of like do i set up a profile do i put a highlight reel together do i you know do these things and unfortunately there's a lot of paid opportunities out there that don't aren't really don't really come to much fruition and i think some families are confused by the whole process of like what do they need to do to try to give their kid the most opportunities um so some of it is providing our you know 15 16 and 17 you teams with a lot of just uh, basics and like standards we would follow as far as what you want to do, you know, get a Twitter profile set up, put your contact information on there. Um, you know, get a huddle highlight video pulled from whatever videos you can, you know, have that all available and, and, and be, you know, willing to respond to anybody that reaches out. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, if I feel like there's kids that really can play at a certain level, I, I will do some of my own personal outreach to my network and, and, you know, say, Hey, you should, you know, really look into this player, you know, follow them. Um, I, I do think one thing we've tried to be is, is, is honest and as truthful about our kids as prospects with these college coaches so that we mm-hmm. can continue to keep that level of trust of like, you know, I, I, I could text, you know, uh, a co a D one coach and say, you should come watch this kid. But if he's really not D one, I'm not really, I'm, I'm kind of doing him a disservice and I'm doing the coach a disservice at the same time. So yeah. trying to be honest and open and, and, uh, you know, obviously in every, a lot of my texts start with like, Hey, I'm look, I'm probably biased here, but like, this is a kid you got to look at. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, it comes down to families, every family, every kid situation, you know, do they need financial help, help and support? Can they, can they afford something? you know, where they don't need as much financial aid and support. Do they want to stay local? Are they okay moving away? 
you know, I think there's a lot of those questions that come up um, that kind of forces the kid to kind of think about where do they really want to go? Um, and lastly, we just try to have a really, really direct conversation with the kids about the expectations and the grind of college basketball. Yeah. I don't think a lot of these kids see that level, right? They, they yeah. can see the, the, they see the like hype videos of like playing in college basketball and they see the like, D1 level of experience of like, oh, I get to go in and get like a cafeteria where there's people are making my meals for me <laughs> and I'm getting on like planes and I'm doing, yeah, that, that does happen in some programs. But if you're going to take like the Juco route, which is totally fine. And a lot of people have been successful in it. That's a totally different experience that you need to be ready for. And there's not a lot of, there's not as much handholding. I'm not going to say no handholding, but there's not as much handholding. There's not as much educational support. There's not as much, you know, um, even like room and boarding support in some of those scenarios. So, uh, you know, I think those are some of the harder conversations to have, but they're good conversations to have with families just to make sure that they're aware of kind of what they're getting into and and what to expect. I guess um, piggybacking off that a little bit, uh, how has that recruiting landscape changed, I guess, from when you started North city with, you know, contact of college coaches and you know now it's like a social media era where these players are going to have, you know, all that at the touch of a finger. So I guess yeah. like, what was it like before it all kind of blew up like that? Mm-hmm. What were the, some of the things you had to go through when it was like that? Yeah, I think early on when we first started the program, you know, it, it was, we were still build, building our network. So it was a little bit harder to kind of have some of those inroads. And, um, you know, I think what we tried to do is early on establish really good relationships with a lot of the high school coaches in the area, which we, we've we kind of prided ourselves on of, you know, I've, I've got almost every West Coast coach I can text about our, one of our players or they can text me or, you know, so that was kind of where we wanted to start building our network and making sure that we were all in communication with each other on opportunities there. Um, the, the biggest change was, has been the combination of COVID and the transfer portal. That's been the biggest um, adjustment. One with COVID, it basically squeezed all the roster spaces on all these college teams which again was another topic i didn't think really got enough enough publicity for a lot of these parents and families to understand where you might have 15 slots on a college basketball team COVID happens you're granting kids one potentially two more years of eligibility Mm -hmm. they're not going anywhere so Mm -hmm. they're not graduating they're not opening up spots for freshmen to come in and take take spots Um, and it's just like a math it's just simple math uh as far as what was available and that was really eye-opening as I had conversations with, with college coaches. I would see them. I would talk to them at some of these, uh, you know, open NCAA certified open weekends. And they're like, we're looking for maybe like one spot. And that's like pretty unheard of when they're there in the summer is that they're looking for one spot. And some of them were like, we don't even have a roster spot. But if like that guy comes along and we're like, we have to add him, they'll figure out some way of, of making it work. Um, and that's probably the biggest difference is, talking to some of these coaches before the transfer portal and before COVID um, it was, it was like, Hey, we're looking for two, three, four spots, or depending on their graduating year, like we're graduating six guys this year and three guys next year. So that's kind of think about how that math works. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's been a huge, a huge difference um, with the COVID eligibility. As far as the transfer portal goes, you guys have probably seen this. And I do think this has been talked about is the, the sort of like downwards effect of the transfer portal. And where like you have kids that are D1 that come in and do a D1 school, they want to transfer. A lot of times they're not laterally transferring to a D1. They're actually transferring down Down. into a D2 or a D3 or an NAIA or wherever. Mm -hmm. And that's happening at all levels. Like a D2 goes D3 or a D2 goes NAIA. And, and trust me, there's programs in the NAIA that are just as strong as D2. And, you know, so I'm not sort of saying that they're necessarily all like every team at that level, but, um, and then even down to the JUCO level where, kids are like i played one year here but i won't i'm not I, I know if i go juco i can get playing time i can build film i can you know build build additional ways of getting so what's that what that's done is then minimize roster spots at the lower levels making it harder for some of the high school kids to find homes um and probably the one that i've seen most impacted by that is at the community college and junior college yep. level um where a lot of times i'd get texts really around this time of year of like, Hey, we're, we're still looking to fill a roster spot. Do you have anybody in mind like that? Like very rarely do those texts happen anymore. 
Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and, and that's unfortunate, I think, for the kid that wants to continue to play basketball and is can play at the junior college level, but because we've made it okay to just transfer and continue to transfer, we're squeezing out the kids that can't get that first opportunity. Um, And, um, and to make it even more poignant, I think the, the other issue is there's some of these kids that if they don't play basketball next year, like they're not going to play basketball ever again. And they might also not ever go to even attempt to go to college, you know? So, you know, now those are maybe a few, fewer sort of examples, but it's still kind of the reality of it all. Um, And uh, so it presents different challenges for each kid to really think about what level they can, you know, they need to start at to get to where they want to go or just where do they want to start at and continue and finish out their, their basketball career. So. I agree 100% with that. The Juco level is being affected the most because <clears throat> like you said, there's just a log jam of people of players coming in. Um, one thing I kind of want to go off of that. Yeah. What is one thing or like how, what's the best way that you sort of approach a player about which level that, you know, he should be playing at, you know, I know a lot of guys assume, you know, I'm a D1, I'm D2. In reality, you know, Juco might be the best bet now and you can get there eventually. But, you know, how do you kind of break that down to them? And a lot of kids don't feel like Juco is good basketball, but it's, it's fantastic basketball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of it is just like tough, honest love yeah. and being really direct with them about where it's at. I think also there usually comes a time and they're like, high school slash AAU career where that realization sets in of where, of where that, where that sort of falls, you know, like yeah. typically if you, if you're part of, let's say this, this 2023 graduating class and we just finished the summer open period, if you don't have D1 schools talking to you at this point, it may or may not, it, it, it's more than likely it's probably not happening. Yeah. Um, so I think some of that is, is, is being real with them, um, you know, and, you know, sometimes I'll share also, I'll ask certain coaches to give, you know, give us a quick eval on, on kids and, and share that evaluation with the family and just, you know, so it's not so much just my coming from my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, a lot of it just comes down to being really open, um, honest, talking to them about what are the best situations for them to be successful. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's more hands-on with some families and then other families they are like, thanks for the input. And then they'll go and kind of continue to manage and maintain their own recru- recruiting uh, plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's shift gears here. And I guess, talk about your, your, some of your squads this year, uh, yeah. particularly that North city 2023 team. Yeah. Uh, just it, it's everything kind of seemed to fit really well with that group this year what was kind of some of your favorite moments and what you liked about that group yeah um uh i think what's interesting about that group is this was the first time that as a group they were playing together so like a few of them have played at times with like i got a few guys that have been with the program like so keegan williams from linwood and stevie kuhn from monroe they've been with the program for a long time so they played with each other a few um and a few other scenarios, but we added some new players. Um, and then also um, Silas Williams um, from Jackson, he he actually played up last year uh, with our 2022 group. So he played with like Jeffrey Anemia and um, mm-hmm. that, that group. So the, he didn't really play with the group that we just had previously. And so, you know, when you add a player like that, when he's going to get that many touches, it creates a lot of, you know, change for folks. Um, and then we added like a Blaine Grand Grandberg from Burlington Edison and added Maddox Preter from Lake Stevens and um uh Keon Silliman from Shorecrest. And so um and like Jaden Hara from Kamiak, he he was part of our, our group um uh before. But again, once you add more than a couple players, the di- all the dynamics kind of change. So um that was a big piece for us. Um it took us a little while. We had some injuries. Maddox actually didn't play for us for almost the entire spring. So that changed kind of up how the we wanted to construct things. It also took us a few tournaments to kind of get roles sort of set. Um, mm-hmm. It's probably one of the biggest challenges in AU is, you know, if I, if I list out all those guys um, and I'm making sure I didn't, I didn't miss out on any of them. Cause they're going to, they're going to crush me. Uh, what about Hayden? You forget Hayden? Yes. I did forget Hayden. From <laughs> yes, from Everett. So he's another new player. Thank you. Yeah. Um, after that, I think you got everyone. I have a list right here. So yeah. Um, 
And uh, Andrew Seminara played for us for in the spring. He transferred down to Bonnie Lake, so that's why he didn't play with us in the summer. But um, another big body that I think has a bright future for senior year. But um, uh, you know the uh, the challenges is if you list out all those guys, they're all going to be the number one option. Well, for the most part, number one option on their high school team. Yeah. And so when you come to the, come to put a strategy together, and you're like, hey, you're not you're not shooting as much as you 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 did in high school. Some kids, it's easier for them to adapt and other kids, it's harder for them to, to sort of adapt to that. And, and they, and sometimes they'd like to shoot to get going, right? Like, Oh, I'm going to get some shots up and see where I'm at. And it's like, well, when you got the chance to either shoot it yourself or pass it to an open person, uh, you know, so there's some balance there. Um, what I did like about him is a really gritty team. Um, we, uh, I thought we played for the most part, really good sound like team defense, which has always been one of our philosophies as far as competing in out of state tournaments is we don't have, we have talented kids, but we don't, we're not going to outshoot any team when we get down into the Californians of the world or, you know, play, play in Vegas and stuff like that. Like you got to play defense. Um, and it's a big game changer on the AU level because a lot of AU teams don't like to play defense. So if you can get a squad that's, that's wants to do that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, you know, we, I think some of our favorite moments, um, we did win a couple of tournaments this spring. That was, that was always, those are always fun. Um, I think in California, uh, we, we played strong. I think we, we tried to give us, we tried to make a very, uh, as competitive as a schedule as possible. Um, you know, and that, uh, not to go off on a quick tangent, but like you can kind of build whatever a you schedule you want in order to give yourself wins or losses, or like you can go into a bunch yeah. of tournaments that you're playing subpar teams. Um, yeah. And a lot of times in these tournaments, when there's college coaches there, you want to play against the best teams. Cause that gives you the most opportunities to get seen. Um, mm-hmm. So sometimes when you look at a record, a, a two and two might not look as good, but it's because you're playing harder teams sort of as you build those things out. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of our games centered around Silas, which you guys are, you know, have probably seen plenty, plenty of, um, you know, the beauty of it is a lot, a lot of times in a scenario like that, where you tell the rest of the team that we're going to put more of our emphasis on one player, they kind of scoff at that or like, Hey, what's going yeah. on? Like, can I get more? The good thing about Sai is he's, he's not a black hole when he gets the ball. So like he gets it, he's doubled, he can pass it out. So then they're, they're like, Hey, I don't have any problem going inside if you're willing to like return the favor. Yeah. Um, so Yeah. Yeah. How do you think um, Silas will do, you know, during the, um, his high school season coming up senior year? One, of, He's one of our favorite guys to watch. Honestly, yeah. we talk about him a lot. Yeah. But how do you think his he will be at, at Jackson? You know, uh, I mean, it, it, there, there shouldn't be any reason why he shouldn't dominate the conference. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I say that obviously with bias, but I also say that <laughs> just given the state of the conference too. Yeah. Um, you know, Unfortunately, I, I, w- I wish they would change this. You know, Wesco 4A, it's five teams. You're, you're playing the same five teams, yep. you know, 10 times, eight times, whatever it is. Um, you know, we got our guys like Keon and Silas are good friends and they're not going to play each other this year at Shortcrest and Jackson. It's like, you know, or that that may be one, not one of the scenarios, but th- we have those scenarios where it's like um, Jackson and Everett aren't going to play each other this year and they're in the same school districts. It's like, does that, that doesn't necessarily make sense. Yeah. So I think given the competition that he, that he'll have in terms of limited number of teams, I think he has a big opportunity. Um, you know, I think also he, he's looking to expand his game, move further out from the hoop, really try to balance sort of his inside scoring with his outside scoring. Um, that's always a hard balance when, you know, you can get easy looks inside and like, do I really need to go outside if i'm getting easy looks yeah, inside he does, he does uh, really need if at the, yeah at the level yeah. for for high school success right. he doesn't need to go outside yeah. for for Future. for the way that college coaches are viewing him he needs yeah. to continue to to move um to move out there so yeah the sky's the limit for him um you know i think uh I his biggest challenge next year um and i'll wrap it up on side is going to be he's going to get doubled and triple teamed all year all long the time. so yeah uh you know, and, you know, boxing ones and triangle and twos and all kind of like interesting ways of trying to not let him get the ball. Um, so I think it'll, uh, you know, we'll see how the rest of the team reacts to that. And, um, but his rebounding is so good. So like, you can't really eliminate somebody if they can rebound as well. So, you know, I think he'll still get plenty of opportunities next year. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I agree. He's definitely the kind of guy who's, um, I think he's in the top 50 for our rankings right now, but yeah. probably a guy yeah. that we're going to trend upwards because he had a great summer, I think. Um, what are some other guys on on the team that you think are going to have some solid years? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, I think, I think, like I said, most, I would say almost all those guys are going to have, um, you know, be, be number one or number two option on their high school team. Um, mm-hmm. You know, really excited about what Everett's building and they've got a bunch of players there that, you know, yeah. you know, with Hayden's Hayden's size and ability, I think and playing off Isaiah white and some of the other kids that are there, Isaiah doesn't play for us, but like just yeah. that, that group that they have and building that and Bobby does a great job at Everett. So, you know, seeing what they're going to build in the sixth year, I'm excited about that team. Um, excited about Shorecrest too. I mean, Keon, Keon took a huge step this summer. Um, and really think he's, 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 he's a really solid player. Uh, he's just, um, and, uh, you know, with, with Parker Bauman there too, like the two of them, I think can really present some problems for a lot of people in the West Coast. Again, Parker doesn't play for us, but, you know, just kind of highlighting his, his abilities. Um, Eddie George actually used to coach for us at North city. So Eddie and I know each other well love what he's doing there. So i um, excited about what Shortcrest has got coming up. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I could talk about all of them, you know, it's like, no, yeah. Uh, go on and on and on and on. Stevie, Stevie at Monroe. He's always, you know, he's always at a moment's notice could go for 20 or 25 with a blink of an eye just because of his yeah, shooting ability, um, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh yeah. So one player specifically on your team that I've watched a lot is Blaine yeah. because I'm yeah. up here in the NWC. Yeah. And uh, I'm really excited for his year. I think he's going to play really well off Bennett. Um, yeah. Bennett How? And I think that Blaine he's going to have a fantastic year. He's, he attacks the bucket. With, yeah. I mean, he's, power. he's, um, so he, he, he took a while to kind of like get in the groove with us because he, he was totally new to the program, didn't know any kids on the team, really took a leap of faith of like, I'm going to join this team. Um, and you know, we basically, we took a lot of time just trying to tell him like, shoot the ball, <laughs> be more aggressive, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you know? And so that, that was something he, he worked on, but, uh, easily, I would say pound for pound, the most athletic kid in the group. Um, he's, you know, he's also a football player. He's, yeah. you know, just really strong, really fast. A lot of times we put him on some of our best, like he had to defend some of the best players, um, which I tell my guys, like, look, if you need to defend the best player, you, it's probably a good chance you're not coming out of the game. So like, that's that if you're, you know, your level of defense is at that. So no, we loved him. Great team player. He was always there. Um, great, you know, very coachable. Yeah. So I'm excited about it. Um, I know they had a coaching change, uh, you know, yeah. so, you know, we'll maybe change up the philosophy and some of those things, but they've always had, uh, Burlington Edison's always had strong teams. So definitely excited about them next year. Mm-hmm. So we only got like a couple minutes here left, three, cool. three, four minutes. Um, what are some younger guys in your program, you know, that maybe we should have an eye on, you know, for the future? Yeah. Um, you're really putting me in the, in the spot. So I'm going to get parents. I know you're only going to have to choose a couple. Sure that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. that. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, I got, I, I made sure I mentioned all of our 23, 23 guys, which I think they're all have really great um, seasons coming up. Um, yeah, I agree. And uh yeah, I, I, I'd be remiss to mention in the 2023 class, uh, I think he flies a little bit under the radar, but I think given all the opportunities he's going to have, Keegan at Linwood, I think we'll, Keegan Williams at Linwood will have a great season. Yeah. Um, been part of our program since he's in like fifth grade, so we've we've really been excited about his growth. So um, love it's with there. He's getting some getting some interest and looks on, on certain schools. At the 2024 level, um, Jackson DeBeal really came on strong for us uh, this this summer. Um, he actually played in a few 17U games with us as well when we were down on numbers. Um, comes from Mount Lake Terrace, so you know Nayland's teaching defense, teaching hard work, grittiness, all that stuff, which we loved. We've had a ton of Terrace kids come through the program, Jeffrey Ananima, mm-hmm. Mason Christensen, Kyrie Arms- Armstead. They kind of all came through, and Nayland and I have, you know, stayed in contact and kind of made sure, you know, that, um, it's clear on kind of how his kids are going to operate in the program. Um, so Jackson, I would see, um, Ryan McFerrin, I think at Jackson is actually somebody that's a little under the radar. Um, um didn't play as much last year, uh, but you know, six, six, and he's going to be playing, you know, we talked about all those doubles and triple teams that Silas is going to get be open. There's his opportunity, um, yep. to step up and be there. Um, so I think he's poised for a big year. Um, we also had, um, uh, the, um, 
Uh, Nate Trickler's uh, the head coach at Sultan. Um, his two sons, uh, the twins, they played for us uh, the 2024 level. Um, and they're just like, they're just basketball junkies. Like they, they just love basketball. They can light it up. Um, uh, Toby and Eli Trickler. And um, so I think, you know, it'll be exciting to watch them um and in, in, in that new kind of newly formed uh division so um and then drew davis and snohomish is another big body um that we're excited about and um i'm probably forgetting somebody and okay get, okay. We'll get on the look but uh we're but yeah. on time too so yeah but yeah that cool. i think that's a great that's great the um all those players uh we actually talked to keegan he was like our second interview i believe yeah i saw that that was great yeah yeah so um thanks for coming on and talking with us about all your players and everything like that um we'd love to have you come on again you know maybe in a few months when all the players are playing and we can talk about their year and everything like that yeah i'm all for it let's do it i'm happy to talk i've got a pretty close connection on all the west coast teams so happy to talk even more broader outside of just north city guys too yeah that sounds great as well absolutely Right. Thanks a lot Thank for you, having Andrew. me on, guys. Thanks for coming on, Coach. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Have a good Bye. one.